I'm going to start with um, a poem of my own as kind of an invocation to the season uh, because uh, it's that time of year, it's transition, fall will be on, uh, on us very soon, and we're kind of seeing summer fray, and that's what this poem is about. It's called Deepest Summer. Possessing boundless and stifling tropical tenacity, August rules with a slumbery and self-satisfied grip. A season of gluttonous greenery of tangled brush, choking vines and smothering leafy shade. It blusters with thunder and lulls us with hazy skies and cloying humidity that sets the skin aglow. Hypnotically clicking crickets and dank, swampy fragrances of soil and foliage leave us drunken in a private vegetable lethargy. Along roadsides, tired grasses grow raggedy, and the heavy evening air is occasionally enlivened with the whir of a few sentinel geese swinging south. Oak leaf edges curl brown, maples flush seductive patches of color, fern clusters are bronze as if bitten by frost, and the luxuriant fabric of summer begins to fade and fray, slowly releasing its grasp and slipping away unnoticed. And this is a, a piece from um, his uh, book called uh, The Mountains of California. And this one's called, this is from an essay called Windstorm in the Forest. Most people like to look at mountain rivers and bear them in mind. But few care to look at the winds, though far more beautiful and sublime. And though they become at times about as visible as flowing water. When the north winds in winter are making upward sweeps over the curving summits of the high Sierra, the fact is sometimes published with flying snow banners a mile long. These portions of the winds thus embodied can scarce be wholly invisible, even to the darkest imagination. And when we look around over the agitated forest, we see something of the wind that stirs. By its effects, on the trees. Yonder it descends in a rush of water-like ripples and sweeps over the bending pines from hill to hill. Nearer we see detached plumes and leaves, now speeding by on level currents, now whirling in eddies, or escaping over the edges of the world, soaring aloft on grand upswelling domes of air, or tossing on flame-like crests. Smooth, deep currents, cascades, falls and swirling eddies sing around every tree and leaf and all over the varied topography of the region with telling changes of form, like mountain rivers conforming to the features of their channels. After tracing the Sierra streams from their fountains to the plain, marking where they bloom white and fall, glide in crystal plumes, surge gray and foam-filled in boulder choke gorges, and slip through the woods in long, tranquil reaches. After thus learning their language and forms in detail, we may at length hear them chanting all together in one grand anthem, and comprehend them all in a clear inner vision, covering the rain like lace. But even this spectacle is far less sublime, and not a whit more substantial than what we may behold of these storm streams of air in the mountain woods. We all traveled the Milky Way together, trees and men, but it never occurred to me until this storm day, while swinging in the wind, that trees are travelers in the ordinary sense. They make many journeys, not extensive ones, it's true, but bent over our little journeys away back again are only little more than tree waving, many of them not so much. When the storm began to abate, I dismounted and sauntered down through the calming woods. The storm tones died away, and turning toward the east, I beheld the countless hosts of the forest, hushed and tranquil, towering above one another on the slopes of the hills like a devout audience. The setting sun filled them with amber light, and it seemed to say, while they listened, May my peace I give unto you. As I gazed on the impressive scene, all the so-called rain of the storm was forgotten. And never before did these noble woods appear so fresh 
so joyous, so immortal. So uh, here you have John Muir talking about sauntering, which we just heard from Thoreau. And we also have a phenomena we don't usually think of as visible. And he makes it visible for us, that the wind, you can see the wind. You can see it in a snowstorm, you can see it in the trees. We don't usually think of the wind as visible, but it is very much so if we look at it from the right perspective.